All right, here we go. Salute to Knicks Nation on this Good Friday, another episode of Fan Fridays, episode three. This is the show where we answer the questions of our franchise channel members, CP the Franchise, Alex Chitaro's here. Make sure you hit that like button, hit that share button, and subscribe to the channel for the number one Knicks show for the fans by the fans, number one Knicks podcast for the fans by the fans. Question number one, Al, let's go. This is from NY Giants fan 84. And they say, salute CP and Alex. My question is, do you think Leon will extend Emmanuel quickly now or wait until he's a restricted free agent? Mm, this is a tough question, but if they're smart, I can see it going either way. Let me just say that. I can see it going either way. I can see it. I, I can see I, IQ getting the extension now. Or I could see the Knicks taking that gamble at the end of the season to see how he performs and see and let the market determine what his value is. If it's me, though, I would extend Emmanuel quickly now. I'd get ahead of the curve, get him on a good contract. He just came off an excellent year where he was second in six man of the year. OK, there it could have gone either way. If you are Leon Rose and you're seeing how he has progressed every single season, I want to try to get him on a reasonable deal. I want to make sure that if he's not going to be here for that long term, you have him on a good value contract like the rest of the other players that you have on the Knicks. That way, if you're looking for that superstar that comes somewhere down the line, whether that be a Joel Embiid, a Giannis Antetokounmpo, like you have that solid contract where another team could be like, yo, that's good value right there for Emmanuel quickly. So if I'm Leon Rose, I'm trying to extend him now because if he does go to restrict free agent, you then open Pandora's box where if you can't get a deal done and then you allow the market to decide what Quickly's value is, another team could come up, come in, and then start to inch that contract to be even larger, right? We spoke to, uh, I forget who we spoke Trevor to. Lane, but Trevor Lane. It was Trevor Lane. Lane. Exactly. You already know where I'm going. You already yeah. know where I'm going, CP. Trevor Lane talked about how the Spurs wanted to raise that contract value for Austin Reeves. If I'm the Knicks, I don't let it get to that point. I try to extend him right now, but I can see it going either way. Yeah, good point. Good point. I, I think waiting could serve the Knicks in two ways. For one, maybe they take a gamble and say, was he going to repeat a six man of the year performance again this year as the guard rotation becomes more cluttered? You just added Dante DiVincenzo into the mix. How will that impact IQ's minutes? Also, he did start 22 games last year. Does that change this year, right? Is Brunson healthier? Does it just quickly start less games this year, which also impacts his market value? So I think his market value could be impacted by the playing time. Also, by not extending him, I think it keeps them a little bit more flexible just in terms of if they need to make a trade during the season by the trade deadline that could potentially include quickly even though i don't think they will because remember if they sign him to that extension before the opening night before the the season kicks off it creates a poison pill where they won't be able to deal him without ramifications until july 1st of the following league year so in other words if they were to sign him to an extension this season right now before the, before the opening of uh, of the regular season and then try to trade him the outgoing salary would be his current number which would be at six million but the incoming salary for the team that's trading for him would be that six million plus the average annual value of the new deal they take an average of that so they take an average of the current deal and the new deal and that number would be the incoming salary for that new team so for that new team it, they might be a little bit leery to make that deal. We saw a similar situation where R.J. Barrett in the Donovan Mitchell trade rumors, where once the Knicks signed R.J. Barrett to his rookie extension, it became a little bit harder to tr make that trade with Utah because Utah would have had to have taken on much more salary in the deal. So I think that would help the, the Knicks if they waited. Now, for quickly, if he waits, does he again gamble to see if he has another big year? Does he get more minutes as a starter, more minutes as a closer? Does he improve in the playoffs, which might in improve his market value? And then how would he look on the open market? There's seven teams that will be that will have cap space next offseason. San Antonio, as we mentioned, Orlando, mm -hmm. Utah Jazz, Hornets, Pistons, Sixers, Wizards. 
if he was looking for you know starter salary of those teams, where do you think he would really be? It's not the Wizards, right? They just got pool. No. Do you think a, a, a maxi quickly ticket, you know, moving on past James Harden? I don't see it. Pistons Nick have. There's this old too similar to Tibbs where I think he, he doesn't want to go to that small guard route yeah. again like he had in yeah. Toronto. You know what I mean? Pistons have Cade and Ivy. I don't see it there. Do you nope. see him in Charlotte with LaMelo and nope. and um, and uh, Brandon Miller? Nope. Does, does Charlotte go that way? How about Utah? Who needs a point that- guard? That's interesting. That's interesting. I think that, that's a legitimate team. I think that's, that's a, legit a legit team. team. Orlando, I don't see it. They they have more guards than they can deal with. But maybe San Antonio again, as you said. Absolutely. The way that they messed with the Lakers, with the potentially they were trying to mess with the Lakers with the Austin Reeves deal. Could San Antonio do that where they muddy things up and put a poison pill deal on his books, on the Knicks books, so that if the Knicks have to say, okay, we're going to match this deal, it kind of muddies things up. I think that's a very interesting play on both sides. But I think ultimately both sides will wait. And then the, Emmanuel quickly will, mo- will most likely be a Nick, but I think they'll come to an agreement next offseason. And don't forget, CP, <clears throat> the Spurs probably still have some sort of feelings because of the Marcus Morris deal. No, no, I'm just playing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you never know. Pop doesn't forget. Pop doesn't forget, man. All right, CP. Question number two from Will from LI. Here we go. When it comes to these rumors about the Knicks possibly waiting to use all their assets to trade for an MVP star player, Giannis, Embiid, what other teams in the NBA do you see us being in competition with when it comes to offering a strong trade package? First and foremost, shout out to my guy, Will from LI. The winner of today's contest, we did offer Al for our submissions, for our question submissions the the chosen questions would get entered into a random drawing to win a Knicks 2023 playoffs t-shirt. My guy Will from LI was the winner, so shout out to Will. Make sure you send us Let's your go. address. Now, look, if Embiid and Giannis are, are on the table, you have to expect all 28, 29 NBA teams would be interested. However, if we were to boil this thing down to the, the best young cores the teams with the best young cores who can afford to pair off some young talent and still have enough to make a move. Number, if I had to go, I'll go four. Four, I'll go honorable mention Houston Rockets. Mm. With Ime Udoka there as the head coach, their signing of Fred Van Fleet seems to show that they're looking to turn a corner sooner than later, expedite the maturity process of their young players, Jalen Green, Jabari Smith, You have Tari Eason, Alperin Sangoon. They're looking to speed that up and make sure that those guys are ready and primed and to either help them win games or help them acquire top talent. So my honorable mention would be the Houston Rockets. Number three, I'm going to go the Indiana Pacers. Halliburton, Obi, Matherin. Matherin, Obi. Look, Jarris Walker. Look, that Pacer team has some nice young talent. Andrew Nebhard. I think they could be making a push for playing this season. And depending on how things shake out as that team develops under Rick Carlisle with Halliburton at the helm, could they be a potential team that puts their chips in the middle within two to three years? I think I think an Embiid being available is probably within the next season or two. Giannis probably next three, you know, when, when the Bucks window closes. Number two, I'm going with the Spurs. Right? How, yeah. how 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 big is is Wembenyama's window to compete for something with his size and durability questions? Maybe they might try to speed things up and get rid of some of that young core. They, now they got to find the salary to 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 make a deal done. But do they look to pair one of those guys with Victor Wembenyama? And then number one, I'm going with OKC. Man, I, I think mm. it's, it's going to come a time where Presti puts his chips in the middle. And decides to compete for something. To me, that that is one of my most promising young teams right now, who who seems like they're on the ascent with a young core and not with vets. They don't have a big ticket free agent. They're doing this with their core, with SGA, Chet Holmgren coming back. You have Josh Giddy playing outstanding ball. Both Jalen Williams. Uh, you have uh, my guy Trey Mann coming off the bench, running and gunning. I think OKC is that team to watch. But the bottom line is, when it comes to the Knicks and it comes to Joel Embiid or even a Giannis, just like Donovan Mitchell, they will not have leverage 
in these situations when it go, comes to trading for these players. So what the Knicks need to do is hope that their young core continues to elevate so that when it's time to negotiate and, and put a formidable offer out there that they can compete with some of the better young cores in the NBA. Absolutely. CP, I agree with your, I agree with that assessment 100%. And, you know, I know like we have to say all 29 teams, every team will want to be involved, but I think the realistic teams are for the most part, you took two off my list that were there. You took the thunder, although I think maybe they would probably stick with that core just because all of them are on, you know, for the most part, good deals. Uh, you got Giddy over there. Uh, who is it? Um, you got Chet who's coming back. I think he's still young. You still got to evaluate him. And I don't see that as like a big destination for two guys that it, they, they, OKC just has the chips. OK, I think for that, you know, when we when we spoke with uh, Dan from uh, the Jack Ramsey, Jack Ramsey show. Right. He talks that he, he mentioned that when star players want to go somewhere or they're about to be traded, there's that negotiations like, OK, here are the teams that are on the table. Where do you want to go? I don't think OKC is that destination. I think what OKC is going to do and I have them on my list. I think they're going to stay in that nucleus and just keep trying to develop there. I do agree with you with Indiana. Here's some other teams that I do think are in competition. One, the Cleveland Cavaliers. Don't sleep on the Cavaliers. You know, they got Donovan Mitchell. If you're trying to entice him to stay and you got some trade ships, Sleeper. look, the, you got you got Evan Mobley, you got Jarrett Allen, okay? You got Darius Garland. That team didn't make it past the Knicks. If you're trying to say, hey, Donovan Mitchell, we're all serious about you, trying to keep you here, trying to compete, you can move one of those other guys outside of Donovan Mitchell to go get someone like Giannis, to go get someone like Embiid. You know, if you're bringing in Embiid, maybe you could say, hey, we'll trade you Jared Allen. Hey, maybe we'll trade you Evan Mobley. If you're Daryl Morey, right, and you're thinking about, hey, I got Tyrese Maxey, a young guy, who's another young guy I compare him with to start this whole rebuild and to still sell tickets and to have a good poster. Evan Mobley would be that guy. So I won't throw the Cavs out of that I, I won't throw the Cavs like out of the mix they're going to be in the mix for someone like those two guys same thing with Giannis man young team competitive you got guys who can shoot up and coming team another team New Orleans all right we know about the Zion Williamson situation down there I know they want to see if they can work it out but still he is a big name a team will take a chance on Zion Williamson if you're someone like New Orleans, you could say, hey, if Embiid needs a new chance, you know, pair him up with B.I. Maybe Giannis can come around down here. We got some shooters. We can play good defense. You know, that that's another team where I'm looking at saying they got a trade asset. They got a superstar where they can move. And it's like it's almost of equal value, which you don't really see too often between Evan Mobley, Zion Williamson. Those are guys where I'm saying, hmm, those are that's pretty equitable. In like what you're getting return. Obviously, draft compensation has got to be in there at some point, too. But at least you're getting something big. As a, as a player name in return. So I'll put New Orleans, Cavs with your with the Thunder and the Indiana Pacers. Al, we've got to take a quick break on the questions to salute our sponsor of today's episode. That is Manscaped. Fellas, go to manscaped.com. Use our promo code KFTV for 20% off plus free shipping. Check out the all-new performance package 4.0. Comes with everything you need. A great starter kit, if you will. Comes with the lawnmower 4.0. Number one men's grooming tool below the waist. Take care of those balls before you guys head back to school or get ready to get back to work. The shampoo, the conditioner, regular deodorant, ball deodorant. You have your ball toner comes with a travel bag and the boxers so it's a great starter kit for you guys to get introduced to manscaped remember manscaped.com promo code kftv for 20 percent off plus free shipping and most importantly no testimonials all right al now the last question comes from our guy my two cents and their question is let's keep it fun but name the three worst nicks in Nick history and why. And by the way, coaches are allowed as well. Let's go. Mm. Wow. Let's go. How should we do this? Go back and forth saying what's number three? You go sure. three and I sure. go two. Sure. You go two? Yeah. Okay, let's do that. Yeah, let's go. All right. Mm, number three. Who am I going to start off with? This is tough, man. There's too many people to name. There's a lot. Who? There's a lot. There's yeah. too many people to name. Yeah. yeah. Which, who? But you know what? I'm going to start off with. I'm going to start off with Michael Sweetie, man, because my Ooh. goodness. Hey, baby, Jack. Terrible. Okay. Yeah. And so, look, solid double double machine coming out of Georgetown, only two years with the Knicks, man. And it was very underwhelming for his, for that selection, man. You look at that first round, the first round selections, 
ain't great, ain't pretty from that year. But Sweetney, there was so much promise of what we needed. He just didn't deliver, man. So I'm going to put Sweetney at number okay. three for me right now. Number three, I'm going with Jerome James, man. Coming off of a stellar 12.6 rebound playoff performance with the Seattle Supersonics in a regular season where he didn't score more, average more than six points per game. Our guy Isaiah Thomas, general manager extraordinaire, decided to give this guy a five-year, $30 million deal in which he would come to the Knicks and average no more than 2.5 points, 1.8 rebounds, and 0.4 blocks in a disgraceful four-year stretch with the Knicks. He would ultimately get traded in the Jamal Crawford deal and uh, ultimately tear his Achilles and never play again. Sayonara, Jerome James. All right, number two. I'm going with Joakim Noah. Mm, go, going, okay. with the cent- going with the centers, apparently, is my theme over here. Joakim Noah, when we got him, man, we knew Derrick Rose. Everybody was saying that was going to be a solid team. That was going to be... A good team with Mel, and you thought, "Hey, Phil Jackson, he should know what he's you, you know you should know what he's doing creating this team." No, just straight up disappointment, man. It was a shell of himself. What we saw from Chicago, and of course, we had to extend his contract, right? Because just was not worth the time, man. Was not worth the was not worth any bit of what he gave to New York. So I'm gonna put Joakim Noah number two. So back to back centers with him and Sweetney. I'm going to go with a coach. I'm going with a coach, Larry Brown, ladies and gentlemen. This is two years removed from NBA Finals, one year removed from Eastern Conference Finals appearance, and Larry Brown coming to the New York Knicks and left in disgrace after one year. He was supposed to help us get our defense in order. He was supposed to help us get the the franchise back on track. We thought we had it with a championship pedigree pedigree coach, and he would finish with an abysmal 23-59 and record with the New York Knicks. If you guys have watched this show, you've seen several player interviews from Quentin Richardson and Channing Fry talk about how dysfunctional that team was under Larry Brown. Look, we, we didn't have the second coming of, of the Chicago Bulls, but we had talent. We had Starberry, Richardson, Crawford. We had a young Nate Robinson, David Lee, Channing Fry, a nice young core. We had vets, um, M- Malik Rose, you know, Jalen Rose. We, we had pieces and, and certainly not a team that was 23 and 59 worthy. They would bring in Steve Francis, the, the, the icing on the cake, and ultimately Brown and his and his protege, uh, uh, Isaiah Thomas, would fall out. And Brown was shown the door after one season, 23 and 59, goes down in a blaze of glory. Who's number one for you? Hmm. Number one, I hate even saying this man's name, yeah. but it's Andrea Bargnani. There now, is. Uh, my two cents allowed executives, it'd be Phil Jackson by far. Yeah. Head over heels, everybody else. All right. So Phil Jackson could get that honorable nomination as being the worst thing to happen to New York. But it's going to be Andrea Bargnani because. You talk about, we just had a solid season, man. Solid season for New York. You know, we go to the second round of the playoffs. Yeah, it was a heartbreak against the Indiana Pacers. But to come back and then say, you know what we're going to, you know who we're going to add? You know who we're going to trade for to come make this even better for the Knicks? Andrea Bargnani. He didn't live up to any expectation of what he was supposed to do. Not a solid rebounder. Not solid offensively. Couldn't shoot the three, which was the whole point was to help extend extend and just space the court space the court for Mello to give him even more space to operate didn't happen whatsoever andrea bargnani will go down for me as one of the worst nick signs because for a team that looked like it was going on the up and up took about three years of making the playoffs after having some dark times and then to miss the playoffs as soon as he gets here it's andrea bargnani man yeah, that's the unanimous. You got it with me, man. Number one, that Hibbert stopper. So they wanted him to be, man. One year after being embarrassed by the Indiana Pacers in the playoffs, the Knicks decided they needed to move Melo back to the three and get a floor spacer at the four. The former number one pick from the Toronto Raptors, Masai Ujiri, picked up the phone and said, I will gift wrap him to you and walk him to New York for that package because they ended up giving up a number one pick, which turned out to be Yaka Pertle, and two number twos which turned out to be guys who weren't much in the league but either way a package way too much for Andrea Bagnani absolutely woeful but his best moment of the of his tenure as a Nick in Milwaukee Nick's clinging to a two-point lead with 20 seconds left and Andrea Bagnani decides to get an offensive rebound gets the ball back and hoist up a three 
to the dismay of Clyde Frazier and his teammates. What are you doing? To Bargnani, what is he doing? What is he doing, folks? Why would he shoot the ball? He can't make it up. But nevertheless, he was ultimately shown the door as one of the most disgraceful acquisitions in this franchise's history, man. All right, Al, that'll do it for episode three of Fan Friday. Salute to everybody who submitted questions, man. If you guys at home want to submit questions, all you have to do is join the loyal, loyal franchise channel members. Hit that join button below for only $4.99, cheaper than a cup of coffee. We'll ask you, ask you for your questions during the middle of the week, and the lucky winners will be have will have their questions answered and potentially win some free prizes courtesy of Knicks Fan TV. We'll see you guys next week. Enjoy the holiday weekend. Peace.